to hacking 10 million useful idiots online propaganda as a socio-technical security project in South Sea CDF with Pablo Brewer and David Perlman. Before we begin, a few brief notes. Stop by the business hall in Man located in Mandalay Bay, Oceanside, and Shoreline Ballrooms on level two. The Black Hat Arsenal is also in the business hall on level two. Don't forget the merchandise store on level two and session recordings from Source of Knowledge. They have a desk on every level. Also, thank you for putting your phone on vibrate. It makes it easier for the rest of us to ignore the ringing while you wait for your voicemail to pick it up. Pablo and David. Thanks everybody for coming out. Again, welcome to Hang Hacking 10 Million Useful Idiots, an online propaganda as a socio-technical security project. Uh, I'll ask that if you tweet about this that you please use the hashtag Hack10Million. Uh, I'm Pablo Brewer. And I'm David Perlman. And uh, why don't we get started by having David tell you a little story. So imagine that you're CISO at a large American-based international manufacturer of internet scale networking and communications product, products. A customer asks you to investigate some unusual errors, and in the process of looking into it, you find a highly suspicious hardware backdoor in an overseas competitor's products. You have some talks with your legal team, and you decide to go through the national cert instead of talking to the competitor. Uh, you do your responsible disclosure, you feel good, you've done the right thing, you're starting to talk to your uh, team about what to tell your, uh, your customers to do about the problem. A few days later, you wake up one morning and there are hundreds of messages waiting for you. Everybody's talking about a highly realistic video of you talking about how important it is for American manufacturers to work closely with the NSA and provide hardware backdoors in their products. You are shocked. You would never say such a thing. The video is completely fake. Uh, but at the same time, the, and lending credence to the rumors, there's reports of a vulnerability in your own software. It's minor. It doesn't really have anything to do with it. But it's adding to the media narrative. And people are starting to believe what's going on. So you call your crisis management team. You have some conversations about uh, spin control, you debunk the fake video, but as soon as you debunk it, another one pops up with your CEO, and then another one pops up with, this, with the uh, head of the NSA. The videos are popping up faster than you can play whack-a-mole. It's a disaster. It's totally out of control. It's an unstoppable trend on social media. Your crisis management team says that it's being boosted by botnets. You talk to the social network companies, but they don't even answer their phones. So you release a patch, but no one even notices with all the noise going on. A debate is raging among the experts. A lot of these experts have suspiciously awkward English diction. Uh, it's a lopsided debate, and the position that you're the one with the hardware backdoors is winning. You, uh, even though you've released the patch, everybody's saying maybe this is just the tip of the iceberg of your work with the NSA. No one's even talking about the competitor. So gradually, the news cycle moves on. You, once things have quieted down a bit, you try to bring up the back door again, but everybody says it's just sour grapes. And your PR team tells you, look, don't even try to talk about this. You, you, you just, we just want everyone to forget about this whole thing and let the stock recover. The stock is starting to recover a little bit. You're kind of relieved. Hopefully, things are over. You can rest again. Now, one day, a few weeks later, you're walking down the street. And suddenly, you're accosted by a crazy man who's ranting about your involvement in sinister conspiracies. He pulls out a gun and says he's making a citizen's arrest because of your involvement in these crimes against the American people and the people of the world. You shout for help. He grabs you. There's a struggle. The police come. A gun goes off. The police take him down. And you're, you're OK. You're fine. But now the rumors about your company are back in the news with a sinister new twist which is that some people are starting to say that maybe this guy was actually a hero, and you had him killed to protect your deep state conspiracy with the NSA. Now, the legitimate news initially sticks to the facts. They're not going to go with anything that crazy. But a few politicians and world leaders pick up on the conspiracy theories, and then eventually a legitimate news outlet quotes one of these leaders, just quoting them without correcting them, and then before you know it, the legitimate news pundits are talking about these crazy, outlandish conspiracy theories about your company 
as if they might be true. Somehow it's made it onto the mainstream news when there was never anything there in the first place. A few nights later, you wake up to an emergency call. Three of your overseas offices are in the midst of protests by angry, violent mobs. The, the local police don't even seem to be trying very hard, and when you look closely on the videos, you see that some of the police are wearing pins and armbands that have the same symbols as the protesters. And you recognize these symbols from some of the online conspiracy communities that you've started to be familiar with. The next morning, one of the leaders who had been quoting the conspiracy theories announces that they're not even going to let you do business in their country anymore. The, a week later, the EU parliament starts saying that they're going to have to have some conversations about the credible rumors of your allowing the NSA to put back doors in your products. They begin a surreal debate of your imaginary crimes. You, the, your stock is tanking. The board gives your CEO the boot. It's an unmitigated disaster, and there's nothing you can do while you're waiting for the EU to come to a conclusion. Now, as a cybersecurity professional, you did everything completely right, but somehow it all went horribly, horribly wrong. Nobody's even talking about the back door that you initially found. The competitors, the bad guys, they got away with it completely. They're off scot-free. No one's even talking about that anymore. And your own company has been damaged far worse than any conventional cyber attack you've ever seen. Now, all this might sound far-fetched, but every single piece of the story that I just told you has already happened in real life. Fake video is a powerful tool to manipulate the news. In fact, a number of talks here have been talking about the power of fake video, deep fakes. Social networks have already profoundly affected markets, and they're routinely used to intentionally manipulate markets, not just to affect them indirectly. Conspiracy theories. Now, conspiracy theories is a big part of this. They thrive online, and they have widely convinced large sections of the normal people population to believe things that are completely ridiculous and totally disregard obvious truths. In fact, conspiracy theories have inspired real-world violence, riots, and even mass murder. And malicious actors have already been documented to be manipulating and even creating from scratch conspiracy theories for their own nefarious purposes, which have then thrived. The only part of the story that hasn't happened yet is for all of these pieces to be put together in a coordinated campaign with a corporate target. But our colleagues in the MisInfoSec Working Group, uh, we've developed frameworks for analyzing these campaigns in a formal way, and it's clear that it's only a matter of time before this makes a jump to the corporate space. Now, at this point, some of you are looking at this and thinking, sure, but this is a PR or a marketing problem. It's not a cybersecurity problem. So to answer that, we're going to introduce the concept of socio-technical systems and show you what it means to hack a socio-technical system so that now that uh, David has given us this little horrifying story, uh, how are we going to fix this? First, we're going to start out by talking a little bit about the brief history of information and transmission. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the instruments of influence. We'll talk about the mechanisms of influence. Uh, we'll explain what a socio-technical system is. And then we'll talk about defense mitigation and what we could be doing as we go forward to address these issues. So first, let's talk a little bit about transmission of information. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. Isn't it how funny how day to day, nothing changes, but you look back and everything is different. That is very applicable to this case. What happened between the last presidential election and the one before that? Why are we just talking about these things now? So misinformation has been around forever. Ramses II used misinformation. He put hieroglyphics on a wall uh, that were intended to frighten the enemies. These messages didn't get transmitted anywhere. You had to know where the message was, and you had to go to the message. So we want to get that message to transmit. So the next kind of revolution, next evolution there is uh, books and parchment. Now, literacy is not common. Parchment is expensive ink is expensive, and so really, unless you were the nation state or a church, you really weren't transmitting a whole lot of messages. It was time intensive, it was resource intensive, and the message could only be transmitted as far as a person could carry it. So around 1440, we get movable type and the Gutenberg Press. And this is the first time that technology substantially affects the way that we're able to transmit messages. For the first time, 
the limited number of entities that can afford to have their message printed can mass produce it and transit out. And this is also the first time in history where the inventor of the technology fails to account for the ramifications of their technology. The Catholic Church was a big proponent of the Gutenberg Press. Maybe you've heard of the Gutenberg Bible. They probably didn't consider the fact that Martin Luther would mass produce his 95 theses and nail them to a bunch of church doors. Fast forward, you get the telegraph and the radio. So telegraph is interesting because it extends the range and we can now transmit things at the speed of light. Now we take a step backwards in the sense that you have to know Morse code and you have to know that the message is coming. This is not a broadcast medium, this is a point to point medium. But Radio Marconi gives us the broadcast medium and now you can transmit a message at the speed of light over a fairly long distance without any specialized knowledge. You only need a radio receiver and to know the frequency at which to tune in. And again, we see kind of this horrible thing of not considering what happens. Because the radio is so prevalent, it is the de facto way to get news. And then War of the Worlds comes out. And people not realizing that it's an education or it's an entertainment thing, think it's actual news and it leads to a fair amount of panic. Fast forward to television, 1950s. Again, we're able to extend farther and further uh, how we're able to transmit. And now we can transmit not, not just spoken word or written word, but now we can transmit images and sound. And this becomes the de facto way to influence people all the way up until social media. Now, if you lived in America, even as late as the mid-1990s, and you wanted to reach the whole of the US populace, you would probably have to be the president and you would go to ABC and CBS and NBC and go listen you're gonna put me on uh, or I'm gonna pull your FCC license to transmit and so they would comply and you would go on and do that but I couldn't just show up at a news studio and go hey I'd like to talk right so we still have a very limited number of gatekeepers that are allowed to control mass communication to the general populace so now we're here and this closes the loop on the information revolution that was started by the Gutenberg Press. We have now democratized mass media. Anybody can transmit to the masses. And we live in a world where Katy Perry can reach twice as many people as the President of the United States and 50 times the number of people of the, for of the former Prime Minister of Britain. And she doesn't have to answer to anyone. There's no gatekeeper there. So let's talk a little bit about the instruments of influence. So influence has been done by nation states for hundreds of years. So we'll talk a little bit about that. The reason it was done was to force other countries to do things that we want in our country to, uh, that were beneficial to our country. And so the, the way that countries influenced each other is they had these levers that they could pull on, we call the national instruments of power, uh, and we refer to it as the DIME model, diplomatic, informational, military, and economic. And that's great, but unless you work for the government, you work in business, and so how are these applicable to you in corporate America? Well, it turns out that you know, your diplomatic instrument of corporate power is your business deals and strategic partnerships, your informational is your PR and your advertising, uh, mergers and acquisitions, not all of those are friendly. Uh, and then your long-term economic is your R&D and your capital investments. So all of these instruments can be used by corporations to influence the public, the customers, their partners, uh, as well as their competitors. So now that we understand why we may do this and how it happens, let's talk about how we functionally do this. So these are the five Ds. These are the strategies for influence, distort, dismiss, distract, divide, and dismay. I'll walk through a brief example of each of them. Distort is when you take a narrative and you change the context or the reality of that. No, 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 Russia is not invading another country. We are liberating ethnic Russians. Dismiss is when you outright dismiss the narrative and counter accuse. China has been doing this for years. Every time they're accused of intellectual property theft or accused of uh, hacking by the United States, the standard response out of China is not only do we not do that, we ourselves are victims of the greatest aggression in cyberspace, which is the United States. Distract is when you're presented a narrative. You don't address the narrative you're presented. You make up another narrative to distract from the original conversation. Uh, MH17 
uh, was purportedly shot down by a Russian missile. The Russian response to that wasn't to address that. It was to ask the question, why is there a commercial, commercial airliner flying into a war zone? Uh, divide is something that we've seen recently and was a big component of the last presidential elections. It's when you get the population, you bifurcate them, you get them warm with each other, and so they're not paying attention to what's being done outside of their own uh, scope. Dismay is ad hominem personalized attacks. These are usually attacks that are of a personal nature, and they're so outlandish, so ridiculous, that the fact that you even address them lends them credence. And probably the most uh, known example is Pizzagate. There's no way to address those accusations without lending the attack credence, and no defense is really gonna solve that issue. So what do you need to do this? Well, on social media, you need a series of accounts. Uh, bots is the, are the first accounts. Bots are relatively stupid. They don't generate content. What they do is they amplify content. They retweet, they like, they repost. Parody accounts are exactly what it says. They are parodies of real entities. They should not be mistaken for the actual accounts. Uh, they're there to spoof or make fun of or make sound ridiculous actual accounts of people and entities. Spoof are meant to be mistaken for the actual accounts, but they're not the real accounts. There's a reason that the president's Twitter account is the real Donald Trump. If you ever wanna have some fun, go on Twitter and just look for accounts that say Donald Trump. It's kind of horrifying, all of them. Um, last, uh, the next one is camouflage. Camouflage is used to infiltrate group, groups, and this is particularly useful if you're using the divide tactic. So what you do is you get two groups that are opposite ends, so let's say the Democrats and the Republicans, you may manufacture a persona so you can get invited to those groups, and you change the narratives internal to those groups so you can get them warring with each other. Uh, deep cover accounts are rare. They're very expensive, they're very time uh, intensive, they're very resource intensive. These are fully backstop personas. Uh, if you try to verify them, they look like real people, and if they're done correctly, they never get found out. The last one and the most dangerous is the takeover. That's when the real legitimate account of that person or entity is hijacked uh, by somebody else. So an example that was uh, shown earlier was the Associated Press Twitter account in October of 2013 was hijacked. Uh, there was a fake news story put out saying that there was a bombing at the White House and the Dow Jones fell so precipitously that they suspended trading. So Pablo gave you an overview of the tools and ingredients that go into this process. And now, as I said, a socio-technical system is the way of thinking that turns this into a hacking problem or a cybersecurity problem. A socio-technical system is a machine where the moving parts are people connected by networks, the inputs are narratives, and the outputs are things like markets or elections that involve aggregate behaviors, not individual behaviors. You can't really model individual behaviors in a way that is good enough to matter but you can model aggregate behaviors very well. The model offers enhanced efficiency to those who want to manipulate human behavior. Its successful employment is a legitimate subject of concern. Mathematical Applications in Political Science, 1966. So a socio-technical system is a system of systems, which means that in order to understand it, you have to consider both the technology and the sociology, or in particular political economics, is the field that models these things numerically. If you try to just think of it as a technology problem or just think of it as a psychology problem, you're going to miss all the important emergent behaviors. Now, the models that they were talking about in 1966 from political economics, nowadays, thanks to big data, machine learning, operating on the data available from online behavior, it is much more real. So the, some of you are already data scientists and I certainly don't have time to be able to explain data science in detail, but I'm gonna give you just a light overview here, sort of a visual representation to give you an idea of what it means to think about hacking a socio-technical system as a system if you're actually doing this in a formal mathematical way. So you represent a population as a high dimensional data set uh, it's uh, called a preference space. Each dimension is one of the different beliefs or ideas that somebody might have. And when you represent it like this, then you can do analysis and planning using mathematical and computational tools. 
So there's an important concept, the Overton window. This is the range of acceptable discourse in a media ecosystem. It's a collective phenomenon. It's not an individual phenomenon. This is what that population can handle in general, not the outliers. In reality, I'm showing you a two-dimensional graph here. In reality, like I said, there's a very high-dimensional data set. The original idea of the Overton window is just a left-right spe political spectrum, but it generalizes easily to this big data problem. Now, imagine that there's a message that you want to get out there that's well outside the Overton window. It's a lot of work to do a PR campaign in a traditional sense where you're going to slowly ease people towards something that they're really not okay with yet. It could take a whole generation for one group of people to die out and another group of people to grow up that are used to your new way of thinking. But if you work with the math here, you can see a possible shortcut. This is actually based on what you would call the door in the face sales technique, but it's adapted to this sort of political economics model. You start with a crazy pitch. That is to say, you have some sort of crazy idea and you rally a small vocal gr fringe group. The data science model can help you target, an an target the anchor message that you're using for this process, the crazy message. And it can do that because you have your target message and then you have your anchor message and you can analyze where the population distribution is and where your messages are within the manifold embedding of the preference space. If you can get enough people talking about it, then the fact that people are talking about a crazy new idea automatically gets it into the news, and this has stretched the Overton window. So, for example, if people are talking about the cinnamon challenge and they're eating spoonfuls of cinnamon, then suddenly in comparison to that, eating spoonfuls of oregano doesn't seem crazy at all. And this, of course, is easier than just directly convincing people to eat spoonfuls of oregano. So now that I've pointed out this idea of a fringe group, now I can explain the title of the talk. The 10 million useful idiots. The useful idiots is a term from Soviet era propaganda. It refers to useful idiots are people who are unwitting participants in spreading adversarial propaganda. And with social media in particular and these planning techniques, you can do this on a mass scale rather than sort of individuals, which was more what they were thinking of back in the Cold War era. Uh, of course, with the, with the internet, it makes it very easy to find large numbers of gullible people to participate in whatever scam you want. Think about 419 scam emails or almost any online scan. So again, these aren't new. So we've tried some defenses and some mitigations in the past, uh, but we've not completely understood the problem. But let's examine what's been done in the past. So I think most of us are probably familiar with fact checkers. Uh, there are automated and there are manual fact checkers. A manual fact checker would be something like Snopes or PolitiFact. Uh, they're a little time late because you, you manually have to go in and verify the fact. Automatic fact checkers sp split any given purported fact into a triplet. Uh, subject, object, predicate, and then they have to decide whether they're an open world or closed world model. In an open world, new purported facts are assumed true unless they violate a previously accepted fact. In a closed world, all new purported facts are assumed false uh, until we verify that it doesn't run amok of any existing fact. Uh, either way, the problem here is they can't handle satire or editorials. So it's of arguable use. On social media, social media analysis, we can use propagation-based detection or time-based cascades. The top uh, graphs there are propagation-based. And on the left-hand side, what you should see is unconfirmed news. And the reason that there are multiple peaks there is those bots that periodically re-amplify the false message to keep it in public discourse. Whereas the graph on the right is confirmed news, it appears in the news cycle, it's accepted as fact, nobody argues the point, and so it gradually cascades. Uh, down at the bottom, you've got the cascade breadth and depth. The green line in this case is true news, and the red line is fake news. Uh, and again, the reason that you get a more graceful degradation of true news is that People see it, they forward it to their own networks, they see it, they forward it to their own networks, and it gradually goes away. The reason you have an inflection point on the cascade max breadth is because, again, those bots will periodic periodically re-amplify that message. More people that didn't see it the first time will see it, they'll forward it to their networks, and so you get a much, much, much slower decay. 
Other models that we've used, uh, the epidemic diffusion model, this is one that came out of medicine. It's used for infectious diseases. And so if you look at this model, uh, S is your subject, it's the person, it's you. RC is the rate at which you are contacted by false information. Uh, and then I is the uh, you being infected, and then you can be cured of it, realize that you've been infected with fake news, and go back and delete the post, delete the tweet. The problem here is while the model is nice and simple and easy to understand, we don't know what causes that catalyst change to go from I've been contacted by false information to now I've been infected with false information. And we really don't understand once you're infected what it takes to convince you to realize that you've been infected and go back and solve the problem. Uh, the bottom model is a favorite of uh, social network analysis. It's called a scale-free network. Uh, in scale-free networks, the predominant characteristic is the formation of links. You form links at a much higher rate than you lose links. Unfortunately, in this case, what we see with misinformation is that the uh, population gets bifurcated. And so the governing characteristic isn't the formation of links, it's the destruction of links between nodes. And so we really don't have a good uh, network model for uh, this kind of social uh, epidemic. So some analysis challenges beyond what I've mentioned for those. Uh, the problem with misinformation is you want to label it as misinformation before the public sees it. Well, we create content at a tremendous pace. 4.3 million videos viewed in a minute in 60 seconds. We now have more computers on the internet than there are people on the planet Earth. This problem is only going to get worse. The speed of propagation is only going to get faster. The computational power required to look at this information and analyze it is going to become greater. Uh, up until recently, we haven't had a framework where we could define these attacks. We haven't had a kill chain where we could explain what's going on. Uh, David mentioned the system of systems. One of the characteristics of systems theory is when you have a system of systems, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, and so you get the emergence of characteristics. Maybe we can define how many YouTube videos you see before you're convinced of a fact. Uh, but what we don't understand is what happens if you watch that many YouTube videos and see that many tweets uh, and see that many Instagram posts, how much harder is it? The last bits are cognitive dissonance and cognitive friction. The reason that misinformation works is you are already biased to believe the misinformation that you're being presented. And so convincing you that your original view is wrong is, is hard, right? You want to hold on to your views. You don't want to believe you're wrong once you accept something as true. That's your cognitive friction. On top of that, not only do you have to change your mind, you have to admit that something is true that you're not comfortable with. And that's that cognitive dissonance. And that is very hard. It is much harder to convince you of something if you believe the opposite than if you have no belief in it one way or the other. Anybody familiar with this uh, copy of the Washington Post? This is fascinating. This happened last December. Um, this is a very convincing message, right? It looks like the Washington Post. Uh, you know, if you have certain political beliefs, you're going to be biased to actually believe this. Who's going to dissent? Right? If you go to the newsstand at Union Station and you pick up this copy of the Washington Post, are you going to pick up another newspaper that's going to disagree with this? And heck, the Washington Post is an authoritative source. It turns out in this case that this was a fairly large misinformation campaign by the Orange Group. Uh, they labeled it as satire, arose by any other name. It's still misinformation. So in December at Union Station in Washington, D.C., if you went to newsstands, if you went to the coffee shop, these were actually sitting there. And they were so convincing that the actual Washington Post not only filed a suit, but they were compelled to actually respond via their official social media and say, this was not us, that is not the official Washington Post. Uh, interesting factoid, this is the first time since World War II that the American populace has been subject to large-scale physical psychological operations products. And if we have this hard time with static text and static pictures and with blog posts, then, you know, what's coming next is much harder. I wish I could keep telling you that our mission in life is connecting people, but it isn't. We just want to predict your future behaviors. Spectre showed me how to manipulate you into sharing intimate data about yourself and all those you love for free. 
The more you express yourself, the more we own you. Couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're fairly educated. We know the dangers, we know deep fakes, we understand technology. But the average citizen doesn't. If they see a video, they're going to believe their eyes and they're going to believe their ears. And imagine it's some anti-government video. Now we're going to bring up some computer scientist, one of us, right, some cybersecurity expert that's going to point out all the metadata indicators that this thing has been manipulated. And if you believe the video, what you're going to say is that that scientist that's giving you all that scientific gobbledygook is a government shill. This problem is going to get much, much harder. So now that we've uh, realized how bad the problem is, we, we need to figure out a way forward, right? And perfection is the enemy of progress. Uh, we can't just sit on it and wait for the perfect answer. So what is it that we can do now? Well, the first thing we can do is try to understand the problem. This is a model that we developed in the MisInfoSec Working Group. Uh, it is the misinformation pyramid. Uh, and there are two ways to look at this. If you're an attacker, if you're the one that is conducting the misinformation, you start at the top of the pyramid. You have a campaign, you have a desired end state, you have something that you want people to do, and you're gonna manufacture incidents. Within those incidents are gonna be various narratives, and those narratives are gonna have various artifacts, memes, posts, stories, pictures. And so there's a direct line and you can look from the top of the campaign and see how everything from the bottom links up to the top. The problem is that if you're a defender, you start at the bottom of the pyramid. You start out by looking at tweets and pictures and news stories and you have to figure out, well, are these legitimate or are these artifacts? And then if there are artifacts, are these artifacts linked? You have to figure out which of these are linked together so that you can discern the narrative. And once you get enough narratives, you can move up and go, ah, this is an incident of X. And then you can try to do some attribution, try to figure out what the campaign is trying to do. The point being, moving up the, the pyramid, fighting gravity, is much harder and requires a lot more data. So who needs to get involved in this? Well, we need industry, we need academia, we need media, we need the community, all of you. Uh, we need some government help. Uh, and we need the InfoSec industry. This is not a mine and yours problem. This is an ours problem. We need everybody involved. Part of the issue is we all speak different languages. So that's why the Misinformation Working Group developed AMIT, the Adversarial Misinformation Influence Tactics and Techniques Framework. If you're familiar with MITRE's attack framework, this is very similar. It is actually completely compatible with the uh, attack framework, and it describes the kill chain and the TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures to carry out an information, misinformation influence attack. The boxes at the top are the various phases, planning, preparation, execution, evaluation. Below that, the blue boxes are the stages. And then the white boxes are the techniques, tactics, and procedures within each of those. If you're interested in seeing these, please go to misinfosec.org. Uh, you can see these, you can click on all the uh, TTPs, you can see the descriptions, you can see actual incidents where we pull that description, uh, and you can add to this. If we miss things, we want your input. If we got it wrong, we want your input. If you like what it is, then use it. So red team and blue teams, how could we do this? Well, we can keep doing the things that we're doing, but now we have to consider more than the ones and zeros. Uh, we need to make sure that things are secure by design. If you're making a platform for information exchange, if you're making a social platform, consider how this could be used and abused. If you're marketing this thing to teenagers, bullying is going to happen. How are you going to deal with that? If it's a news media, who gets to publish? How are you going to verify the provenance of that information? Uh, Sec DevOps, you should be doing this as you're developing the program so you can build in protections during development and not at the end. Uh, you should have centralized monitoring, not just for the health of the digits, but also for the health of the conversation. The other thing we should do is assume a breach. Assume that your product and your platform are going to be abused. Have a plan in place to respond to it. How are you going to respond to deep fakes being used on your platform? For the red teams, very easy, threat modeling. You should be able to add this kind of attack, this socio-technical system attacks, to your product. 
You should consider those types of adversaries. You should test for those adversaries. You should do the code view and verify that the protections that we put in there are actually valid and useful. So in summary, misinformation is a socio-technical security problem a socio-technical system, the populations plus the networks, the whole thing can be hacked. This has physical and financial consequences for your business. Businesses need to care about this. This isn't just a political problem and it's certainly not just a PR problem, it's a security problem. Technology cannot solve it alone. When you consider the ways that your product can go wrong, you need to consider the ways that your product can go wrong with the population of users and that is a design problem for the product. Every new product has to consider how it will be abused, as I said. And we need to share threat information across communities. We'll tell you a little bit more uh, at the end about what we've done to help make that possible for you. So a parting thought, it's very easy to look at this from a Western perspective where government and industry are separate. That is not the case everywhere else. And remember I mentioned that nation state instrument of national power of the economy. It could very well happen that your company is the target of a nation state economic influence campaign. So this isn't a notional thing, this is happening right now. So Black Hat Sound Bites, the most important thing that we would like you to do if you're convinced by any of this is tell your corporate leadership to care about this. Tell them that this is a security problem. It's something that you either need to design into your products or you need to look at how it might affect your business. Please go to misinfosec.org. Look at the work the misinfosec working group has done. Look at AMIT. Tell us it's useful. Tell us it's not. Tell us what we missed. Tell us what we got right and then implement it or implement something similar. Follow at misinfosec on Twitter. We have some very exciting announcements coming up very soon. Some things that are already uh, pretty much the ink isn't even dry yet and we can't quite talk about them but there's going to be some big news coming up soon. The last one is there is going to be a stand up of a cognitive security information sharing and analysis organization. Please consider joining it, get involved, share threat indicators. Uh, we are developing schemas for sticks and taxis so those threat indicators can be shared with existing tools uh, and we need your help. Thanks for coming. We do have time for some questions. We would love to talk to you about this and actually I'm very happy that uh, SJ who is the primary contributor to the GitHub is here. So we'll, we're all going to go over to the uh, wrap room at the end of the time and we can have some conversations and also we have stickers. If you're going to ask questions please walk up to the microphones at the beginning so everybody else can hear. Do we have any questions? So over time, people became skeptical of the claims of advertisers. Do you think that people will also become skeptical of this kind of misinformation over time? And what do you think are the implications one way or the other? Yes. <laughs> I, I didn't hear the question, but what he said. People, so the question was, people in the past became skeptical of other channels of information. At first they were very gullible. For instance, there was the war of the worlds. People heard this announcement on the radio and they panicked. Nowadays if you heard a story on the radio, you're not going to have mass panic. People are just kind of used to it. They're skeptical. Uh, and I think it's a very reasonable prediction that people will uh, also become skeptical of every other channel. It, it's possible that the biggest implication of this is that people are going to become skeptical of every source of information and then you run into a situation where there's simply no shared knowledge which really undermines you know the sort of political philosophical foundations of the very idea of freedom and democracy. Uh, not that that's a big deal or anything. So, so real quick, um, uh, first off, having worked on sticks and taxi for the last four years, I'm really excited to hear that you're actually looking at that for um, uh, looking at social attacks. Uh, we've, we've pondered if we could do that. Um, do you have any examples that are out there yet? Have you, have you done any research on it? How far along are you? And how can we get involved in that? And this is why I'm particularly glad that SJ is here because she can really give you a nuts and bolts answer to that question. Great. Can you use the microphone please SJ so that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so 
Hi, yeah, we took the Sticks Taxi apart. I'm currently in the middle of implementing that, so that's going up on the repo as soon as I've had enough sleep post DEF CON. So, and please give me your business card so I can see how I've cocked it up. Sir, at the end, please. So, looking at the list of tools and the what was up on the dash there, right? Instagram, a lot of these legacy platforms that exist, right? So, now with the prevalence of Mastodon, Pleroma, these explosive Fediverse networks, everything there was single party controlled and there's a way to stamp it down through some sort of an order or something, right? How do you address something like that? It, what's the model? So, the, yeah, it's, it's very easy to kind of fall into these stovepipes and only consider your platform. That's why we want to stand up the ISAL so that the various social media companies and corporations can share threat indicators and be on the lookout. Uh, it, it's, this is not going to be a silver bullet problem. It's going to be a thousand bullet problem. So the corporations need to monitor the health of the discussion for their social media. The social media companies need to do their bit. The government needs to be able to fund these kind of efforts where information sharing can happen. And really we need help from the hackers to educate the rest of the community and the rest of the populace on how to be more skeptical. Uh, hackers are great at this. We don't believe anything. Um, <laughs> But the rest of the the rest of the populace believes what they follow, uh, and we've all got biases, hackers included. Uh, and so, when you're in your own echo chamber, and every message that you get via every channel reinforces your bias, it is really, really hard to have good civil discourse and listen to the other side. And that kind of toxicity is leading to serious problems in our democracy. Sir. In some of your analyses, have, is there a, kind of a mathematical limit of how much information people can absorb? When you get all these different things in and out of your echo chamber, at what point do just people saturate? That's, that's a great question. Uh, that's a cognitive theory question. I'll take a first stab and then I'll let the, the cognitive theorists deal with it. So uh, the limits of information that can be taken in aren't well known. It's not so much a limit of how much information you can take. It's having a variety of information. If you only get information from one side of a discussion and that's all you get, it's very hard to have a balanced view and to have that public discourse. So think of a, an analogy where there's questions of public health and then there's questions of public health security. Uh, there are a lot of questions about public health right now from the point of view of the attention economy. There are groups like the Center for Humane Technology and the Time Well Spent Movement in Silicon Valley. A lot of people who aren't the ones running the platforms are thinking a lot about you know, the overload of attention and divided attention and exploitation of attention. Uh, extractive economies where the attention is the resource being extracted and we're kind of at the point where it's like tight shale, we're like fracking people's attention now. So that, that's a public health problem and there are a lot of people working to raise awareness of that and try to talk about that, you know, now like even your phone probably has a like, hey, here's how much screen time you had last week. So when you have a weakness in public health, then you're vulnerable to somebody introducing some sort of attack agent and that's kind of what we're talking about here. There's the public health question, which people are kind of already doing a good job of talking about. And then what builds on that is that that makes the system weak and vulnerable to an intentional attack. So I, the, the, what you were saying about overloaded and divided attention is critical to this. And fortunately, it's also important in its own right. And there's whole other groups of people that are working on that element of the puzzle directly which I hope you'll look into some of those names I just mentioned because they're really good people. Also, use the tools on your phone that tell you how much screen time you spent, et cetera. Please, sir. You talked about the Overton window. Uh, one of the things that we saw in the misinformation campaign in, in the 2016 election was that the Overton window was pulled in multiple different directions at the same time. Is there a breakdown of that theory if the Overton window is stretched uh, all the way out? Does it pop like a balloon or something? Well, that would essentially be what you just said would be the sort of formalization of 
I think it was the very first question about what if no one believes anything anymore. If there's no common shared narrative that people have, if there's no shared knowledge, then th then the concept of the Overton window, you're right, the, the, it's broken. It doesn't make any sense anymore because everybody's not on the same page and you can't even say what messages are acceptable and what messages aren't acceptable. Uh, and as I said before, yes, that's a really big problem. The other problem that goes with that, and let's, uh, I'll just briefly address the political problem. So Bruce and I wrote a, a fantastic blog talking about this. Uh, and, and one of the things that he said was, in order for democracy to work, we need this common political knowledge. And the common political knowledge is we all have to believe in the legitimacy of our rulers. Uh, we have to understand how the government works. Uh, and we have to be willing to have this uh, other political knowledge that's contested where we solve our problems. So, you know, any of the issues of, hey, how do we want to do social security or do we want to do social security or social medicine or not? How much government intrusion do we want into social affairs and vice versa? Uh, and so when you get to uh, stretching the, the populace, Right? Now it calls into question, we can sit here and we can argue about votes changed or didn't change. What we can't argue is there was an attempt to influence the results. Uh, and as in that attempt, there are questions about the legitimacy of the election. There are questions in some people's mind about the legitimacy of the rulers. There are questions about whether or not the election worked and the government worked. And that's an attack on the foundations of democracy. Um, what's interesting here is that it happened primarily via social media. If this had happened via dropping of leaflets in Times Square, I would hazard to guess that we would have had a drastically different response from the U.S. government and the U.S. populace. Uh, and so we st have to start asking ourselves, is there a difference? Should there be a difference? Should we treat them the same and how should we respond to these things? So wait, hold on, I want to add one more thing there. I want to bring this back to the relevance for corporate security because, you know, in the narrative that I told, I think 20 years ago, the idea that maybe some sort of online fringe conspiracy group would end up, you know, trashing your company, that nobody, I wouldn't have told a story like that back then. And even if I wrote it as a sci-fi story, it wouldn't have even sounded believable as a sci-fi story. But it's exactly the, the fracturing of, the, the, the sort of limitation of reasonable discourse that makes it all too possible. I mean, there's somebody who, in fact, was a mobster, was shot on the street just recently, like maybe a year or two ago, and the guy believed in these conspiracy theories and he thought he was a part of the deep state and he's like, I'm going to do a citizen's arrest, and then the guy tried to fight back and then he shot him and then he's dead. And like, it wasn't even political, it had nothing to do with politics. So it's actually, you know, like I said, it's already happening that conspiracy theories, anybody can say anything about anyone and it can lead to mass destructive activity. So we are going to have to do something about the fact that the boundaries of the window are weak now. Ma'am, please. You have a couple of different actions up on your screen that are towards the security community, but for us trying to reach out of that community, are there a couple of um, tips or directions moving forward we can take for starters since we seem to be um, influencing a much larger community? Great question. Thank you for that. So uh, allow me to correct that perception. The first thing that each and every one of us can do is go outside of our comfort zones and watch news media and follow people on social media that absolutely infuriate us. Uh, I do it, I, I think I have to replace my coffee cup about three times a week. Um, but what it allows me to do is understand what the other side of the issue is saying. I don't have to agree with it, but at least I understand what they're saying. That allows me to have a more balanced approach when I have that discussion. I can systematically try to convince them that they're looking at it wrong or they can systematically convince them that I'm, convince me that I'm looking at it wrong. Uh, the other one is uh, when you look at AMIT, AMIT is actually there for all of the communities. It is not just a technical community, so please go take a look. Uh, there are things in there for journalists, there are things in there for academics, there are things in there for industry, there are things in there for the general populace. So uh, it is absolutely there so that all of the communities that we need to help us work on this misinformation and influence problem can contribute because we need all of your views. This is not a technical problem that we can solve with technology alone. 
And just to amplify the in the same vein, the the idea of uh, you know following people that you disagree with and replacing your coffee cup every week, it even just consider for a moment, even if you are right about everything, which I'm sure every single one of you here is right about everything and your beliefs are all the best beliefs, even if that's true, once you start to think of this as a systems problem, a hacking problem, and even a security problem, then at that point you take a step back and you think, well, obviously I need to understand what are the narratives that are a part of the attack. You, you know, it's not a matter of like, well, those people are so stupid, why would I even care what they think? It's an attack on a system and you have to understand what the attack on the system is. You don't even have to admit that you might be wrong about something because, I mean, I can't admit that I might be wrong about something, but you still need to understand what are the attacks on the system. Okay, if there are no other questions, thanks so much for your attention, thanks for coming.